So Active SQL Server, uh, this is the optimizing Active SQL Server introduction. And uh, next month I'll do the intermediate. And then after that, this is your host Juan Soto broadcasting live from Chicago. Presentation is provided by accessusergroups.org. We have a new group starting this uh, September. It's called Access for Beginners. So please help us spread the word uh, regarding that group. Uh, Susan Pine, who's the uh, access uh, was the uh, accessusergroup.org administrator, uh, is taking that up. So please uh, consider joining her for our first meeting this month in September. Well, look, I'll, I'll be the first one to tell you SQL Server Express, uh, which is the thing I'm going to be talking about. The best thing that ever happened to Access. Uh, you know, Access was never designed for a large group of users. Now, being an Access expert, I can optimize it to work with up to 25 people. Uh, but when you're dealing with that number of people, it can be very problematic. You're going to run into crashing issues. You're going to run into data corruption issues, slowness. It really is a pain in the butt to just have a Access end with Access backend and being able to optimize that for a lot of number of groups so if you're users. So these days, we don't even bother with access backend. So any application we do, we just automatically use SQL Server Express or a regular license for SQL Server. Now, there's several advantages of using SQL Server Express. Number one, of course, it's free, uh, uh, and you can install it anywhere. It doesn't have to be a server. You can install it on a PC. Uh, a lot of my clients, they buy a new PC and they put it in the corner. Nobody touches it. There's just a SQL Server you can see. Uh, it handles a lot more data than Access. You know, Access has a two gigabyte limit, which is another reason why you may want to upgrade a SQL Server. As you approach that two gigabyte limit, it's going to get slower and slower and get more problematic. You can quickly reach that limit if you're adding photos uh, and uh, images to your database and documents using the attachment field, which is a big no-no. You want to avoid doing that with Access. A SQL Server, however, can handle that no problem. With the blog, uh, with the um, with the data type of uh, um, the blog, I said blog. Jeez, now it's escaping me. But there is a data type, the field type there uh, called burp burp. <laughs> That's with a B, where you can uh, use that to attach documents. It's not easy because you have to code it, but uh, we've learned over the years how to do that, and you can find that code on the web. One big problem with um, blob. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Paul. One big problem with SQL Server Express is there's no automated backup. You know, I mean, there's some issues with this as well, is that uh, it only limits it to just one core. So if you install it in a 16-core server, it's only going to use one core, it's only going to use one gigabyte of RAM, and it's only going to allow you to have a size of a link gigabyte database. Now, having said that, it's still like going from a bicycle to a car. What we, uh, what we found is that uh, I can count on one hand the number of companies that migrated from Express to SQL Server over the many years I've been doing this. I've been doing this for almost close to 30 years now. And I can tell you it's just uh, really a great solution for Because, you know, to, to think about it, access databases are small to begin with. They're less than two gigabytes. And then you, when you import that data into SQL Server, if it was 150 megabytes, It'll be like 30 megabytes in SQL. So SQL Server does a better job of uh, 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 compressing that data, making a file. So I don't predict you ever would run out of space on a little gigabyte database using an Access application if you're not uploading documents or images, right? If you're uploading documents, images, you may, may run it out of problems after a couple of years in SQL Server. Uh, there is no backup in FTP. Uh, so we recommend SQL Backup on FTP, which is a free program, or we recommend you buy the $38 version. It backs up not just your database, but also your master database and your user database, so it keeps it, it make it super easy to restore. So we recommend that program. And if you have any questions, just stop me. No problem with that. There's just a few number of people here today. All right. So... Um, Something that when I first started doing the career as much, we got SQL Server in the cloud. It's a, it's a real uh, pleasure working with SQL Server in the cloud. If you've got several issues, number one, you want the database to be accessible to everybody without a VPN. Um, you want somebody to, you have employees outside the business, or you have clients outside the business, you develop an application for your clients to use it. So it really is. Uh, an alternative that's good. Having said that, you're going to be dealing with several issues. Number one is, of course, you need internet at all times. 
uh, to use the app. Uh, it's not faster than on-premise. You're looking, you're looking at that latency issue with SQL Server in the cloud, right, which is going to be an issue. Uh, and you want to avoid that by uh, optimizing that relationship with Azure and SQL Server. We'll be talking about that later on, either this month or next month. And um, it's data center dependent. Now, I've only had one issue once with Microsoft going down on me uh, last year where um, – uh, the, the cloud center was just unavailable to interrupt operation. That only happened once, so it's, it's much more reliable. And I always like to tell this story about uh, a client, a potential new client I was visiting, and he has a, um, a cowboy uh, store here in, Ch in Chicago where he sells cowboy boots and cowboy hats and clothing. Really old-fashioned kind of guy. He still does a lot of things with paper, and I was talking about uh, designing an access database for his business, and he tells me, you know, I was mentioning the call option. He says, oh, I don't want to be in the cloud. Don't trust the cloud. Said, okay. You know, he got he got really belligerent about that. I'm like, okay, why don't you give me some scissors? He says, what do you want my scissors for? I says, well, you have internet here, right? And the business, yeah, we use it for email and web browsing. Okay, well, I'm going to take the scissors and I'm going to cut your internet because by the mere fact that you're connected to your ISP, you're in the cloud whether you realize it or not. That's the common misperception people don't realize is you got – Internet coming into your business through this uh, box from the from the ISP, Comcast or AT&T, and you probably don't even have a professional firewall. So whatever firewall Comcast or AT&T give you, that's what you're stuck with, and you can easily be uh, compromised if you're not careful. And so I tell them, you know, you have this data here in on premise. There's several issues with that. Number one, um, you could uh, have a fire and lose everything. Number two, somebody can break in, steal your server, steal your PCs, lose everything. Number three, you can have equipment failure, lose a hard drive, and don't have adequate backups, lose everything. And so uh, those are issues that are solved by having their data in the cloud. And we do um, SQL Server hosting or access databases for our clients, and so it's just a great alternative. Here's some examples of stuff that we've done where we use SQL Server in the cloud. We have this one uh, company that does uh, has franchisees throughout the U.S. and we develop a solution for these franchises to be able to log in, and it's one database, a multi what you call a multi-tenant database, in SQL Server where you have one database and it's used by multiple franchisees. Of course, they all do the same thing, so they all share the same table designs, and we use a franchise ID to separate the data, so one franchisee doesn't see the data from another franchisee. Uh, and they were they, before we came in, each franchise had its own access database. And so um, when it came time to pay corporate, they would send in a report with their check. Well, you know, as you can imagine, corporate wasn't really happy about that. And so they paid us to make it a, a web solution, uh, excuse me, where cloud host is access. So still front access in the front end, cloud host in the back end. And now they get real-time reports as to what the franchisees are doing every day in terms of clean homes and offices. And we've had a few other examples there in terms of uh, how we've helped clients over the years. This is a wonderful way of doing it. Here's another example of how SQL Server really has helped. We, uh, we have a foam mattress manufacturer client here in Chicago. They have three plants here in Chicago. They have 10 plants throughout the U.S. Uh, and foam mattress manufacturing, if you've ever seen it, I recommend you look it up on YouTube. Um, I'll get to your question in the second clause regarding SQL Server replication. But if you look it up on YouTube, what it is, it's a foam head that starts like this small, and then as it goes down the line, it grows bigger and bigger until it's five feet tall, and it's um, 50 feet long and weighs 5,000 pounds, and they cut it with a, with a with a saw, and then the conveyor takes it to the warehouse, Then they call that a big one. It's 5,000 pounds, 50 feet long, five foot tall. It cools down for several days in the warehouse. And then when they're ready to produce a queen mattress or a king mattress, they bring it out. And well, the operator who's cutting those mattresses, they're cut into smaller cubes, smaller buns. And then that small bun in turn gets cut into mattresses. And what they'll do is they'll notice imperfections in the foam, like gaps, discoloring, uh, miss, uh, uh, excess foam on there. And they'll just cut right off. And so they usually typically have a 7% loss in uh, the manufacturing process. Well, the person who hired us, the QC director, 
she would uh, get this information. She would compile the information in Excel and do the analysis. And two weeks later, she realized that Ron may have had a 12% scrap. And so she'll try to go back to the production line and say, hey, you guys had a production run two weeks ago with 12%. What happened there? She says, lady, I can't remember what we had yesterday, much less what we had two weeks ago. So using a SQL Server and Microsoft Access, we put a, we have put a PC on each production line. They get real-time reports on uh, losses and uh, it, uh, she used Power BI to monitor the production lines in real time. So that same day, she can go to a production line and see uh, what why scrap is spiking. So it's just a wonderful way to uh, use the combination of Access, SQL Server, and Power BI. So Klaus has a question here. Klaus, thank you so much for your question. What application between SQL Server in the cloud and, and uh, SQL Server Express on-premise possible? Yes, you can have replication. I've never tried it with SQL Server Express, <clears throat> but there is a gateway that Microsoft provides as free that you install on your local premise. And that gateway then will upload data to the cloud, and you, so you can establish rules like once an hour, once a day. And we've done that several times in the last six months. Not sure if I, never, I've ever tried it with SQL Server Express. I believe it would work, but I'm not 100% sure. So thanks for the question there. All right, so there's some misconceptions about how they got started with Access with SQL Server. Number one, all I have to do is use a SQL Server Migration System, which is an amazing tool. We use it all the time. And I just link the tables back to Microsoft Access front end, and I'm off to the races. I'm done dealing that. Couldn't be further from the truth. The fact of the matter is that unless it's a really small database with a few records and a few tables, you can experience some issues with slowness and performance. Why would you experience those issues with slow performance? Well, uh, I talked about this already. Oh, I thought I had okay. fixed problems with access. Well, first of all, the access system may have had problems to begin with, right? There was slowness before you went to SQL Server, and those slowness issues will, will magnify once you go to SQL Server. What would be those slowness issues? Well, it could be bad table design, not normalized. It could be lack of indexes, lack of foreign indexes, um, lack of a... Uh, Multi-key, uh, multi-key index, multi-field index, right? It's just all kinds of reasons. You want to resolve these issues. This is my first tip. Resolve any issues you have with your Access database. That would be easier than doing it later in SQL Server. So you resolve those issues, and then you move up to SQL Server. We'll be talking about more tips as we go through the night. Let me go back to my presentation here. All right. So there's several things that you're going to mean you're going to need to know. SQL Server Migration, SQL Server, excuse me, Management Studio is just a wonderful tool. It used to be that you have to install the version of Management Studio that was reflected in the version of SQL Server you have. Now you can just install the latest, which I believe is uh, version 18. And there you can um, use that with any version of SQL Server, which is great. And then SQL Server Migration System for Access is a tool specifically designed to migrate your data to SQL Server. Now, it used to be you could do that from Access itself. There was a tool in the database menu, and some older versions of Access still have it, but it doesn't work. I don't recommend you use that. I recommend you do this. Why? Because the SSMA, SQL Server Migration System for Access, has the knowledge and the word thought to do things to your tables in SQL Server that you need, such as row version fields for every table. Uh, automatically setting the bid field to uh, the default value of zero. So, for example, if you have a yes-no field in your access table, it becomes a bid field in a SQL Server, which is zero or one. And there's a bug. There's a bug. If you don't set a default value of zero for that field in a SQL Server, it'll crash this access database. So the migration system takes care of that and many more things. And then uh, you want to also get the latest driver SQL Server. This has been outdated. Klaus can uh, give you some links to the latest version of uh, ODBC driver 18, I believe, for SQL Server just came out. Uh, I'm not sure. If this is misspelled here. Let me fix this. ODB. Now, it used to be if you, um, when you were, I was doing this, before this, I was using the A-Client 11. I only installed one driver, the A-Client 11. The worst thing you can do, here's tip number two. The absolute worst thing you can do is use the driver that comes with Windows. That thing is obsolete, hasn't been upgraded, and it's just a disaster. Don't use that. Use the latest drivers for ODBC and ODB. 
and uh, you'll be fine. Thank you, Klaus. Uh, Ron, excuse me. Let me, let me just save this. You know, and I see that mistake every time. I just did three nights in a row in Iowa last month, and that was an experience. I traveled 800 miles, ate pizza for three nights in a row with dinner, and I spoke to three different groups in Iowa. They call it the Iowa Tour, the Sequel Server Groups. Oh, my gosh. I'm not going to do that anytime soon, but uh, they'll probably have me in a couple more years from now. So I had a lot of fun with that. All right, so the only BC driver 17 for SQL Server. Let me see if I can get you those links real quick. Uh, second here. SQL Server. SQL Server. SQL Server. Uh, I'm a little hesitant to show you this one because the fact that I believe it's no longer 17. I think it's 18. Let me see if there is an 18. No, it's, um, is it still 17, Klaus? Yes. Okay, so this is the right one then. Which one got updated? Lady B? Um, let me see. Yeah, stop. Let me put in the comments there for you. See, where is that comment? Here we go. This is the old DBC driver, 17. I'll put the comments there. And then the old ADB driver is for SQL Server. Let me get that for you. Old ADB. Now, these old ADB drivers were deprecated no longer. You certainly heard that, um, that they were deprecated. That's no longer the case. And in fact, they, they just got updated so that they can leverage Azure at their directory, which is really great. Quas brought me attention to this. Um, uh, where you can, um, so there it is, 18.242 for SQL Server. So this got updated really good. Now you can use Azure AD. So, oh, thank you, Klaus, very much for that. Appreciate it. For that blog, lead, lead, you can read Klaus' blog about that. And Greg, thank you very much, Greg, for the details there. So everybody help me put you in tonight. Appreciate that. All right, so um, that's my next step. Make sure you use the ODBC Driver 17. Well, let DB driver 18. Now, some of you may not realize when would you use one or the other. Well, all DBC driver 17 is used when you pass through queries and access, which is a special type of query that allows you to connect direct to the SQL Server engine. We'll be talking about pass throughs next month if we don't have time for that today. And then all DB driver 18, we use that for table linking and uh, ADODB, mostly ADODB, which is uh, what we're talk about. All right, so we talked about slowness um, and, and auto optimize. All right, so let's talk about this. So remember I told you that just upgrading SQL Server may not be enough. Well, you may need to create views and store procedures. You need to maybe create <laughs> common table expressions, which is something we'll definitely touch on in November, so we'll come back for that. You may need to optimize your execution plans. Now, what am I saying with all this? Basically, what I'm saying with all this is you have to become somewhat of a SQL Server developer. And that was a transformation for me that I loved. I loved the latest and greatest tool with SQL Server Migration. I mean, sorry, SQL Server Migration Assistant and SQL Server Management Studio. It was a pleasant experience for me to learn how to do T-SQL. The tools are powerful, intuitive. I just loved it. And I hope that you do it too when you, when you go down this journey and start using it. So what we we'll talking about views and store procedures and CTEs in the next three months here. So please continue joining us every month to learn more about that. All right, so we talked. let's talk a little bit more about uh, SQL Server Migration Assistance. It creates database tables and views in SQL Server. So it will actually take queries that you have in Access and convert them automatically to views, which is great when you have some complex queries. Uh, but I always exercise caution here in the fact that uh, you need to double check that the results you get from SQL Server view is the same as um, the uh, the um, the old query that you would get for Access, right? So if you got 1,500 records from Access, make sure you get 1,500 records from SQL Server, and uh, your your record selection is the same. Uh, usually, what I do is I just convert the tables to SQL Server. I do not convert any queries. And then after the fact, I'll go through each query in the access front end, and I'll check them, and then 
I'll optimize those for views. I don't automatically create views for all my queries and access. I just do it for certain um, for certain problematic view queries. It creates indexes, adds row version, which is a misnomer. I believe it's called row version, but it really is something else. Um, the name escaped me, but you'll see it's row version at SQL Server Manager Migration Assistant. It does the default value for big field. We talked about that. Uh, we do recommend you use our chart unless you live overseas like uh, Klaus does, and you need foreign characters in your database. I'll use bar chart because it uses less memory. Now, one big advantage of SSMA is, and I'll be demoing that here, is you, it allows you to help you uh, pop, propagate your, uh, not propagate, but migrate data for alpha, beta, and final rollout. Let me explain that. When you first start with a SQL Server part migration project, the client's going to give you a file. It's going to say, okay, this is my existing database. And you convert that. This is made the first time around. That's called the alpha version. And then you add views, and you may add some uh, minor tweaks. But that this was first round. We call that first round optimization. We, uh, we, we just give that to the client with just maybe some views. Then the client has your system comes back with some bugs, and now you go into a beta. Well, when you go to the beta, you want to hand the, the data, we have to hand the database to the client using a uh, the latest update from data from production, right? Because they, they've been using production database all along, so they may have new orders, new customers, and they want to see that in the version you just gave for beta. So you use SSMA to update the beta. And then finally, once all the issues have been ironed out with slowness and bugs, you really roll out. Usually, if it's a mission credit or lab base, we'll roll out on a Friday afternoon or we'll come in Saturday morning and we'll do one last rollout. And what SSMA does, it uploads all the data for you right from that production database into SQL Server. So you don't have to do any queries or any, um, any uh, import, manual imports like you do in the old days. SSMA would do that automatically for you. It's just a great way. Thank you, Klaus, for the information regarding the. Uh, the latest version of uh, SSMA, which is 8.4. I believe there is a technique to get the latest version of SQL Server Migration System. I've been watching the Hypnosis video, Hypnosis video there. Uh, let's see here. Let me get you this. Do this. Let's see here. I believe it's aka.ms forward slash SSMA. And I got this from the uh, SSMA manager, aka MS, forward slash SSMA. Let me see if that, that's the one. Yep. So with this technique of typing in aka, aka as that dot MS slash SSMA, you're always going to get the latest version of SQL Server Migration Assistant, aka dot MS slash SSMA. Let me copy this to the comments. It's important you use the latest version because of the fact that um, there are multiple versions out there, and this latest version will update itself. So it's just uh, once you start with this one, you don't have to worry about uninstalling and reinstalling them. And by the way, fun fact, access is the number one use for SQL Server migration because as long as you have MySQL, Oracle, SAP, but access is the number one use for SSMA. Oh, Which I will tell you, a lot about how access databases are used in the wild compared to other systems. Okay. All right. So, um, all right. So let's talk about you. You you did SQL Server Migration Assistant. You did your first pass. You know what? Before we do this, why don't we go ahead and do a trial SSMA? So I'm going to launch my SSMA and my SQL Server Migration Assistant. I'm going to show you some things here. So. I'm launching my SQL Server my, my, my <coughs> 17. I've got SQL Server installed on my local computer. So I'm going to create a test database. Let me move this over so you can see it. Second here. Log into my local machine first. Need 
to update my SSL, my SQL Server migration system. All right. So I'm going to do a, uh, I'm going to create a new database here. So I'm going to do a new database. SQL Server Academy. Break out my new database. Now I'm going to launch Access. And I'm going to create, I'm going to use a template to uh, create a dummy database with a back end and front end. So I'm going to go, well, I don't know, asset tracking is good. All right, and that's under one document. So let's see. Uh, SQL Server University. <laughs> Oh, don't start uh, with that because then you'll get me going. I haven't had dinner yet. All right. So uh, the, all I wanted this was for the tables, right? Because if you look here, these uh, things have tables on them. There's no data with them, which is unfortunate. So I'll just go ahead and get some data in there if I can. Well, this is the problem. Let me see if we can find a um, database on the web, which is... Uh, I can use instead with some data. Can you check out why I do that? What about Northman? Which one? Northwind. Northwind, yes, Northwind. Yeah, I'll just go ahead and download that. Yeah. That one is a good old stable one that we can use. That's who wants to join us tonight. I think we got more people. Thank you so much. All right, so um, I got the uh, link to download Northwind. All right, get Northwind out. Open access. Enter Northwind to search for online. All right, well, I just, I just, got, I just have to do is open access. I'm gonna do that now. Find Northwind. Now, usually when I do this course on uh, SQL Saturdays or um, um, SQL user groups, I don't have the time to do a SQL Server Microsoft Assistant um, training. So this is great that we can take some time during this uh, session to show you this. All right. Now, let's take a look under the hood. We should have some some data there. Here, let me just change this to object type tables. Perfect. All right, so we got to your hearts. So I, I call this, uh, let's see here, I call this, it's under my documents. F1, I just call it enough for All right, so I'm going to close this. Now, tip number four or five. That is, um, when you're dealing with SQL Server Migration Assistant and you have, like I do, Office 365, uh, which is click to run, you're going to run into the first issue, which is they won't be able to read your access database because the Jet Engine is installed walled off. So you would need to download the uh, Microsoft Access uh, 2013 uh, database engine, I believe, or 2010. I can't remember which one it was. So I'm going to launch my SQL Server Migration Assistant now. So SQL Server Migration Assistant. Migration Assistant and need to install it on this PC. Give me a second while I do that. AKA dot MS SSMA. Installing SQL Server Access. Come on, give me the link already. That's why I installed SQL Server Download page. Here we go. Now you have two versions here. Now um, I usually follow the one for the Office version. So you want that that the 86 version if you have Office 32 bit, which is what I have. Okay. Get this installed real quick here. I give my firstborn to Microsoft if there's an issue. Typical installation. And I do want to send telemetry to Microsoft. I click install. 
near the USC. So most likely I'll need to download the engine as well when I launch this if I don't have it installed. So let me just see. Google server migration assistant for access. All right. I like this uh, little startup wizard. It helps you out tremendously. All right. So always give it a name. Why are you going to give it a name? Because you're going to use it. Remember I told you, you use it for alpha, beta, and final rollout. So always give it a, a name. And store this. Uh, store this. Don't uh, discard this file after you're done with it. Okay, I picked Azure. Let me go back and pick my local version of SQL Server. Let me find out what version of that is. Control N. I do Control N to launch a new window, and I do Select Add at Version ST SQL, and then I click on Execute or F5, and it tells me I got 2017. So now I can go back here and pick 2017 from the list, click on Next. Now I get to add my databases. I'm going to pick the Northwind database, my documents, this one is created. And if I don't have the engine installed, it's going to probably have a problem finding those tables. Let's see. See, that's the problem. It doesn't have the tables. So I need to download the engine now. So I'm going to cancel this, and I'm going to get the database engine. Klaus, do you have that link already set up for me? No. 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 All right. Because you're pretty, you're pretty, you're much on top of this stuff. I thought, you know, for for sure, you would get me the the engine. I can uh, just uh, <laughs> use that. All right. So let me get the uh, engine. What version should I use? I usually use 2010. Do you have any preference? Engine. Somebody's shaving. All right. So now you got to download the engine. Again, I download the version that is compatible with my version of Office. Let's just do it to bed. And I only need to do this because I'm used, I got Office 365 installed, which is what you'll normally find in most installations these days. Not, not most everybody goes with the Office 365 um, setup as opposed to buying Office outright. So this is free. The engine is free because you can use it as a developer for your applications, uh, and they make it available for free. Let me go ahead and close my migration assistant and start from fresh again. <clears throat> All right. Now I'll launch my migration assistant. So now I'm going to your computer has my restart. We'd like to restart now. I'm not going to restart. I'm going to try using it without restarting it. If now we can do this. So you want to reboot now? No. All right, let's go ahead and try this now. SQL Server Migration Assist. It may not work if I need a reboot. If I need a reboot, then we'll do this next month. Let me send you the link, by the way, to download the uh, executable for uh, access. That's right here. Let me bring up my comments, chat. Come on, there you go. Okay, so I sent you a link to the distribu download distributable. Enough when I'm gonna save the SQL Server 2017. All right, existing so yes. The databases. Enough when. Next. Hi. Reads my. Oh, see, probably because I have to reboot. No, it's okay. Let's see. Okay, good. See, now I see my table, so that's great. Okay, now I need to connect to my local SQL server. And I, where do you read that? Well, you read that from here. See, it says desktop dash 4 etv b 50 That's my local machine name. So uh, I can use that, or I can just think, I think I just can do it local. Bracket, Mr. Local Installation. And now the database is from SQL Server Academy. SQL Server Academy. And Windows Authentication. Let's see if it grabs it. If 
now I have to put the server name. See, this is why uh, people who are uh, lazy and spending more time. Yeah, all right. Now we got to put the server name, which I should have done before. All right, so it's... Now, um, if you do an instance, you've installed the instance, right? You need to be mm -hmm. the name. In my case, I don't have an instance, so I'll show you what instance. I mean by instance, desktop dash 4e tv v5. And I'm not sure if it's an O or a zero, but I think it's an, a zero. Let me try that. That might be an O. Localhost, yeah, I could have tried that too. I thought it was just local. Now, how do you know if you have an instance installed? Well, when you look at this here, see, you would, you would say forward slash the instance name. So you would have to fully qualify that with your steward name slash instance. And when you have a corporate environment, that's what usually happens. You have an instance that they provide you. So I believe that's an O as an Oscar. If not, we'll try the local host. <coughs> All right, thank you very much. All right, so look, I can pick the ink tables. I'm not going to do that. I just want to show you how to migrate the data. Now, this is a very important process because what it's doing here is going to analyze your access tables and come back with error messages. Now, the first thing it comes back with is you'll see, that, of course, there's no tables because I haven't uploaded, right? So it hasn't created a table. So I'm going to click on OK with this. I picked every table, by the way. And now it's going to create those objects in the SQL Server, and then it's going to upload the data. Now it's migrating the data. All right, so you had six errors, warnings, and so forth. So you would go through these and find out, right? The database type not supported. So these are things like the attachment data type that does not work in SQL Server. You would need to abort this process, fix that issue. In this case, you need to remove that field from that table and then go through the migration system. So you always want to fix these zeros. Not going to go through that. Let me just see what other error messages are there here. So this is a good example of what you'll find. Again, the attachment database not supported. Actually, when I double clicked on it, brought up that table with uh, particular, that particular table, which look at employees. So um, a lot of these, they usually don't have these many warnings. So don't uh, get panic if you get shouldn't get that many warnings here. All right. So I can look at the report if I want to. So this is good stuff. And you can actually do a uh, test migration. And I'll tell you how much time it would take. So 20 tables successfully migrated was the output. And then here's the error list with the warnings and so forth. So you can, I believe you double click. It brings up that table, customers in this case. And it tells you what the issues are. All right. So what did it do? It created the tables in, in SQL Server, right? It uploaded the data. It told you issues it found. And uh, you can now, when you go into SQL Server, you'll see that now. One thing that you're going to notice is in the customers table, for example, in this case, let me just double click on that. You don't have a row version, right? There's a uh, regular view. But when I open that table on SQL Server, however, so here I go to customers, I put that in design view. A couple of things. Now you see this timestamp. Called the timestamp, which really called row version, but the old days they call it timestamp. I don't know why the team hasn't fixed it, but this timestamp is critical. And I always put it in my tables. A lot of, like Armin Stein will have a different opinion about that. He's another excellent MVP. I always put it in all my tables because otherwise I might get some error messages. And to avoid error messages, I'll do that. But basically, he says if two people are on the same table, anything I did that might cause issue if there's a timestamp. I don't usually have that issue with my applications, and so um, I never have even with multiple people. So in my case, it didn't affect me, so I'm not worried about that. But I always put this as my tab, timestamp. Another issue you'll find is that use MVAR char. So let me show you how to fix that. So you want to go into your tools. Before you do the migration, you should have done this. I should have done this. You can go into project set, global settings. And uh, let's see here. Logging. I said global settings. Projects, let's go into project settings. Tools, project settings. And type mapping here. All right. So remember I told you that MBAR char is good if you have foreign language otherwise. So here, I'll come in here and I'll change this. 
<laughs> Excuse me. I'm allergic to teaching without dinner. So I'll come in here and I'll change this to bar char. Right. And then the next time I run my wizard, it'll remember that and it'll do it. Now in this case, it takes the link from here and replace it. So uh, I want to make sure it does the same thing, right? Whatever link that's over here, puts it over there. So I'm not going to replace it with one. And uh, here, uh, it already does that for Varchar Memo. Uh, and Varchar Max, right? This is a memo field. So memo fields are Varchar Max. Here, this is another one. And Varchar Max. I'll change this to Varchar Max. Varchar Max. Where are you? There you go. So memo field and access, bar char max. Attachment field, not compatible, use a blob. That will come after you do the migration. So now that I've done those changes, then I should have done the migration and so forth. Okay, so where the magic is, you went through the alpha version, then you two weeks later, you got a beta version. You update the store database to the latest production data. So you would load this migration assistance. I'll show you from scratch how I do this. I'm gonna close this, I'm gonna save my project, Northwind. And uh, I'll save it with the metadata missing. Save that. Then I'll launch it like if it was two weeks later. SQL Server, SQL Server Migration Assistant for Access. Remember, download the 32 bit version if you got 32. I'll close this. Go into my projects. Bring up the North Wind. All right. And so it will connect automatically to my database file. Now, if you move this database file, like if I move the Northwind table file, it won't, show, it won't see it, right? And I've got my SQL server here at the bottom. So it connects automatically to my SQL server. All right. So reconnect the SQL server is up here. So I'll click on reconnect. I like doing that, right? Ask me for my credentials. I'll click on connect. Now that I've reconnected, it will allow me to then uh, click on this database here. And this is what I use for my beta trials. I click on migrate data. What does that do? It does several things. Number one, your production data file has new records or changes to records or customers. It's gonna wipe all your SQL Server tables clean. So if you wanna preserve that data, you can't do that, right? So if you wanna keep your SQL Server data, for whatever reason, you either back it up or not do this, because it'll wipe over. So I'm just click on continue. And it does only the migration of that data in this case here. And this is what I love. It actually tells you what percent of records got migrated over, in which case we want to see 100%, right? How many records they show? I'll be 100%. And I'm done. So I just updated my SQL Server table for beta trials. And then when I'm ready to roll out, I do the same thing for uh, for my uh, um, for my rollout in uh, production. Just a wonderful tool, bar none, best thing. Now, notice that I could put queries here. I usually don't do that. Sometimes if they're really difficult queries and I, I don't want to bother creating this query from scratch in SQL Server, I'll try it and I'll, I'll pick that query. So I'll pick this query, for example. Now, a couple of things about that. If your query uses a custom access function, look, which sometimes we tend to do as Microsoft developers, you need to remove that. Otherwise, it won't recognize it. It'll tell you it can't migrate the query. So I'll come in here and I'll click, OK, uh, convert, load, and migrate this query. Uh, it doesn't find it didn't find inventory for a right, so it's going to create that view and then click on close. Now let's see if it did that. So I'm going to go my SQL SQL Migration Assistant. Let's see if I did that right. I never use this, so let's see if I did it right. No, I got to refresh. So let me see. No, I didn't do that. So I need to. You know, it's not converting load and migrate. It's something else down. Something else. I know I've done this before with uh, with queries and create views in SQL Server. I can't remember what it was. Usually I never use this, so I'll just go ahead and let me see. Maybe we can schema. You want to overwrite it? Overwrite. All right, here it is. This is the code, right? Conversion finished with seven errors. So I could copy this, paste it into SQL, into, into SQL Server Migration Assistant and create that, create that uh, equivalent. Now, one of the couple things, why is this important? Well, because in Access, the syntax is not the same as in uh, SQL Server. So for example, when you're adding two values, you use the ampersand 
that needs to be converted to a plus in SQL Server. Um, you have double quotes and needs to be converted to a single quote in SQL Server. Uh, when well, you're doing like uh, um, star something star, it needs to be like percent something percent. So the syntaxes are not the same. And in my start here tips on accessexpert.com slash start here, there is a blog article of information on the web where you can see the differences in operators and you can learn what the right, what, what the right ones are for each. All right, let's go ahead and continue with the presentation. Close this. I'm gonna save that. Go back to my presentation. All right. So you did that. You created the access a SQL Server database. Now you're ready to see where this is going to be slow. And any kind of complex application, you're going to bind to find, bind, you're bound to find some slowness, right? In particular, if uh, oh, by the way, you have to link those tables back, right? So you need to link those tables. I, I use DSMless linking, and we have code in house that we do that with. You can find code on the web for DSN linking, but you can just as easily create DSN. And because this is an introductory course, I'm going to show you how to create the DSN. I know probably a lot of you guys know how to do that. You're going to ODBC, 32-bit, uh, mind you, and then you click on Add, right? And you come down to those new drivers you installed, which is, in this case, 17 for SQL Server, ODBC driver 17 for SQL Server, right? And I'm going to call it NARFWEND. NARFWEND. I'm going to pick my server. All right, and again, I got to put the server name, and let's just do this. Local local host. Let's try that. John Claus told me it was local host, or somebody told me in the comments local host. All right, and this is we need to talk about SQL Server security. You can use SQL Server security and Windows security when you're using Azure data services and you're not logging in with a Azure Active Directory. Uh, via domain, you're using SQL Server security. When you're on a local network, like I am on a local PC, I'm using Windows Authentication, so I'm gonna leave it like that. And I'm gonna change my default database over to Northwind. Let's see if it reads it. If it doesn't read it, then I'll have to go back and put the actual server name instead of localhost. You want to shy away from using stuff like localhost if uh, because you want to be as specific as possible. So I'm gonna go back here. Let's put the right name of it. That is desktop dash or etv tv e five o b five o. And I know it connects when I can change the default database. That's another check. There it is. So SQL Server Academy. Click on Next. I can finish. Test the data source. Always important. That's going to succeed. It. Click on OK. Now that I've created the DSN, now I can launch Access and link my table. So for example, uh, I can either go to the original Northwind. I'll just launch Access here. Bring up my Northwind database. I just created. I'll hold on to shift key so I won't execute the code. I'll start up. Go to external data. New data source. Um, database. Uh, from SQL Server. Let's see. I always use the SN list, so I never I never use it this way. So let me just wing it through here. Okay, so machine data source, file data source, machine data source. I got my an older version. There you go, F North one. Here it is. Click on okay. All right, and there they are. Now, problem number two with this. If I select all of these, right, look, it includes the systems. You don't want those. You don't want the sys dot. So uh, you only want your tables, right? So I'll just click through these. Okay, hold on, shift key. I select all of them now. I'll just do this. You have to manually, that's the number, that's the drag. Well, you do it only once, then you just with the file. With the DSN, that's another thing. If you create DSN, you have to create DSN on every workstation on the network that's going to access the database. That's one of the reasons why a lot of developers like myself, we go dsn list, we just hand it to the customer, and then we know it's going to work. So I'm going to click on OK. And now that uh, has created these. Now, here's another problem. If you hover over there, it tells you what database it is. 
but also you notice it's got a DBO underscore. Why is that an issue? Because your queries and forms and reports are looking for what? They're not looking for DBO underscore customers, looking for customers, right? So in this case, I would have to delete my customer table, my old customer table, and then rename. And then rename, told me to about some relationship, relating this by pressing F2, coming in here, deleting that. Now you have to do that further step. With my, my DSNS code, it doesn't do the DBO underscore. It automatically does that for me. So that's an advantage of using code to create DSNS tables for you. And you can search that on the web. Uh, great. I actually created a blog post on DSNS that you can look into. All right, so PJ's got a great comment here for me. This might say fine, but most builds, views, Forms and reports, but must but must build views for forms and reports. As far as I know, I and one person in US have must for project work. So it saves you a lot of hassle and ideas and migration headaches to solve. I mean, that is certainly possible. You could create views for all your forms and reports. Now, keep in mind, we're going to be talking about this next month. When you use a view for a form as your data source and you want to edit the data, that view needs to have an index. So we're going to cover that next month. How to overcome that. Um, but, you know, most times I get away with, even for databases that are in the cloud that have that latency issue, I can most of the time just bind a view, I mean, a, query, a table to the form and uh, do it that way. All right. So uh, this is a good time to stop here. So this month we covered uh, why you should use SQL Server. Uh, we, we, you're going to run into issues with the optimization that we're going to be addressing next month with views. Um, we talked about how to use SQL Server Migration Assistant to make your job a whole lot easier than it used to be back when I started. Back when I had hair, we didn't have that. And then we talked about how to create DSNs. The problems with DSN, it's convenient because I can just go into the external data, click on DSN, see my tables. But then again, you have to create DSN every workstation on the network. You have to rename those tables. Um, so it is a little bit of a hassle, especially when you have a lot of tables. Like this application doesn't have that many tables, but I've run into applications that have dozens and dozens of tables, and that's not a lot of fun. All right, so I'd like to open for any questions you guys have, and this is your chance to talk about questions. Actually, um, yeah, so this this slide here, I started talking about it. I like to, I like to make this comment here that slowness is subjective. We, we once had a project where um, the developer came to me and says, Juan, that form, uh, that re uh, report is taking 30 seconds uh, and uh, with the SQL Server version. I says, well, let the, let the client decide if they want to spend the time because we were short on time with the budget and I could live with 30 seconds. I know it's a lot, but maybe it's a report they don't often use, right? So we hand them the data project back. The customer calls me up and says, hey, Juan, Man, that report is super quick. Which one are you talking about? He was talking about the 30-second one. I says, what do you mean? Oh, man, that used to take 15 minutes. Now it only takes 30 seconds. You guys are geniuses. I'm like, okay, slowness is subjective. And because I didn't want to blow my budget on something like that, no, we, I actually told them during the call, I says, look, you know, I can get it down three seconds, but then I have to do CTEs and I need to sort procedures. He says, no, don't worry about it. Let's move on some other stuff. We've got time. We'll come back to it later. So slow for you. It may not be slow for the customer. Now, I like to use a three-second rule to determine slow and determine if that would be the way, right? So three seconds is 1,001, 1,002, 1,003. Boom, it should show up, right? The report, the form, whatever it is. People are willing to wait 10, 12 seconds, but you push past 15 seconds, 30 seconds, forget it. You're going to start getting dirty looks from clients. All right, you got a great question here from Greg. I'm currently using SQL Server Net Client version 13, which would be the equivalent. Yeah, you want to go with the ODBC driver 17, your know, LADB driver 18, because that's where Microsoft is moving. They're moving towards uh, towards that. Oh, by the way, next month we're not doing SQL Server Client. We got Pedro Lopez, who's in charge of these drivers. He's going to be presenting with me next month. So we're not doing up uh, uh, Academy. We have a Microsoft employee, Pedro Lopez. He'll be joining us. That's going to be a real treat for us. And you can ask some questions about um, uh, about uh, these drivers. All right, DAO, LABC, ADO, ADB, very good. All right, thanks, Klaus, um, says Greg. Thank you, Greg. Appreciate that. 
Um, you know, Greg, when I go to Cambodia, you know I'm going to look you up, buddy, right? So we can go to – you show me the ropes down there in Cambodia. I need to find a sickle Saturday in Cambodia, come down there and present. I don't think my wife will let me uh, go there by myself, though. So uh, any other questions? Anybody have any other questions, comments, criticism, comments? I need to map daytime and access to determine whether that daytime too or whatever it is. Well, is, is that an issue with my client's CPS? Yeah, you want to use daytime too, right? So if you do daytime, use daytime too on SQL Server. All right. And then access, access form filter on table from Greg. Access form filter on table. Well, can you give me a little more for instance there, Greg? Leslie, thank you very much for the thank you there. Okay, filter for you open the form. Yes. So there's two ways. When you do the do command that open form in a query in a code, excuse me, in access, you can supply a filter or you can supply a where clause. I like supplying the where clause because it limits what they can see once they once you open the form, right? So for example, if I've, I I had a I had a, the largest insurance company in the US for storage units. You know, when you go get a storage unit, uh, uh, around here, public storage, they offer you that policy, insurance policy, well, that was my client. And uh, they had 100 users and access with SQL Server, and they have millions of records on SQL Server. So obviously, I wasn't going to open the insurance form and show them one of one million. So what I do is I would do the work clause and do command that open form, and that would supply the actual insurance policy ID or customer ID, order ID, whatever you want to do and be able to then just show them that record. Klaus has a little difference from uh, the opinion from me. He says to use the old daytime sometimes, depending on the driver with the old one, daytime is better. Well, if I've used the latest driver, I think you would agree with me, Klaus, daytime too would be better. What about changing the filter via OD, via OBBA once the form is open? Will it pull it back, all the data, then filter on that one end? All right, so a couple of things. When you do apply a filter via VBA, Make sure you turn off the filter. Turn off the filter by do, by saying make that filter uh, on equal false, I believe, and then apply your filter because otherwise you run into the risk. And I've seen this in a couple of cases where you apply a filter on top of a filter, right? So if you say filter for all customers in Ohio, and then you say filter for all customers in Nevada, well, obviously there isn't no Nevada customers in Ohio. Now you get no records. So I usually go with the try to ensure. I turn out the filter that I form in my VBA code, and then I do me that filter equal whatever that filter is, and then me that filter on equal true. Yeah, and PJ's got a great point, right? If you um, if you use a parameter SQL view, you can do that. But again, if you use a view with a form, you have to have an index, and we're going to be talking about. And you can see in my blog post start here, there is a blog post that talks about. How you just go and access create an index on a view. SQL Server migration, my SQL Server Management Studio may not allow you to create an index if it's a not a deterministic view. And basically, what it says that the value of the view can change over time based on some based on some criteria. It won't let you create the index, but you can create an index once you link it to the access front end. Yeah, temp bars are great. Love temp bars, man. Probably one of the best things ever. Now, I do have a blog post on how to retain session values from one session to the next. Because let's, let's say, for example, use 10 bars, right? I open the database, I use my 10 bars, I close the database, what happens to those 10 bars? Poof, they're gone. Next time I open a database, I got to repopulate them. Well, I created a methodology called ReGV, which is Re Global Variable, and WriteGV which is right global variable using a table, and I call that multi-session variables, like temp bars, but they're multi-session. So the next time the system launches, it checks the table for those values. So this is not a table the user would see. This is a table I use as a programmer to store my settings, right? And uh, you're welcome to use that code. It's called ReGV and WriteGV. All right, any other questions, guys? Did you guys like what you heard today? Are you guys uh, happy with what you heard? Thanks, Greg. Well, any advantage of sending record source of form, Paul wants to know, versus sending me, yeah, with the filter, they can remove the filter, 
and now you're back to seeing those million records again. I don't want to do that, right? So I want to be able to use a word clause and just force them to see just what they need to see at that moment. And that retrieves that data from SQL Server. Now, access, now fairness is not going to retrieve million records, right? And so you, in theory, you see one of a million, or uh, actually it wouldn't show you a million, it probably show you one of something, and then you click the end of the form, and it takes forever to get to the million record. But I don't want to deal with all the hassle, so I just use the word clause, and then I use a search form. So it's okay. Somebody asked me, well, how do I open an insurance policy? Well, go to the search form. Search for the insurance policy, and then click on the ID in the search form, and it'll open up a magic for you. All right, any other feedback? Yeah. Anybody's nice, uh, Greg says, loved it. You guys have enjoyed it today? All right. So join us next month where we are going to have uh, the Microsoft employee, uh, and uh, it's going to be great. He's going to uh, he's going to uh, talk about the drivers.